Good to go. Um, so thank you for joining us in the second part of our two-part webinar series. Um, yesterday, we had the pleasure of hearing from Edwin Bowes, who provided us with a valuable insight into data security posture management. Today, we're building on that foundation by discussing the critical next steps in any DSBM journey. How do we protect our data once we understand our security posture? To answer that, we're joined by John McGuinness, a senior solutions engineer at Forcepoint with over 20 years of experience in the cybersecurity field. John's expertise will guide us through understanding the vital role of data loss prevention as we continue to secure and manage our data effectively. Um, extend a warm welcome to John McGuinness. Thank you, Chris. Um, for the audience, um, I will try to give you as much uh, important information as I can in a short period of time. I do recommend you reach out to us if you want to dive deeper into anything I speak about here, if anything piques your interest. Um, okay, so yesterday, and it's a recap, which is quite important, um, Edwin asked a, a number of questions yesterday. Do you know what your sensitive data is? Do you know where it is? Do you know who has access to it? Do you know why they have access to it? And ultimately what they're doing with it. And I mean, they're, they're five obvious and important questions. Uh, Force Point DLP is uh, the industry leader in DLP and has been for quite some time. And we have some of the largest companies in Ireland who use our DLP and they can't uh, confidently answer those questions with a yes. And the reason why is historically DLP uh, solutions have been around for quite some time, but organizations have always had their data on premise behind the perimeter. They could put their arms around it and they could control what people were doing uh in the confines of their organization and how they would exfiltrate it and prevent them from doing that of course data is not always behind the perimeter anymore and we're going to touch on that in a moment the overlapping point here is what what are they doing with their sensitive data and this is a crossover between dspm and dlp why is it a crossover having visibility and control into what people are doing with data every day in their working life uh, and controlling what they're doing. And I mean, there's so many avenues in which they, they, they're able to exfiltrate information either maliciously or accidentally. And the, the majority of data loss is accidental. So yesterday we showed a maturity curve and the first stage, as Edwin quite rightly said yesterday, the missing step from a data security posture as an organization and a mature data security posture is DSPM. Many organizations have implemented DLP solutions without ever understanding their data. They put in solutions and policies on the premise that they had a fair idea what they wanted to stop and who they wanted to allow to do certain um, actions with data. Uh, but they never really totally understood the data and they probably dealt with it as it came along and probably changed rules as it went along. DSPM will answer those five questions for you. If an organization is serious about data security, they would do the, the free data risk assessment, give themselves a fright and start to address data uh, from that stage. But for today, we're gonna concentrate on the top right-hand area of that uh, maturity curve. And the first point along that maturity curve is data loss prevention or DLP. And there's an interchangeable term there because if you look at some of the control points above there, DLP has interchangeable meanings. Data loss prevention, and data life prevention, or sorry, data loss pr protection, data loss prevention, and data life protection. And the reason why I say that is because if you've got data in the cloud application like OneDrive, and there's many of them out there, but let's take OneDrive as an example, that data has already gone out of your organization. It's in a public cloud, it's in public SaaS. So it's already out of your organization. So we're not talking about data loss prevention at that stage, we're talking about life, data life protection. We know our data is in somewhere like OneDrive, and we need to ensure we protect the life of that data. So for example, a uh, sensitive or a confidential document is shared publicly to joeblogs at gmail.com as an example. Well, that's not really protecting the life of that data. And anybody that subsequently has a link or has that public share link uh, has access to that data. So, so I, I just wanted to maybe separate those meanings out there. You know, that we do, we do have a use case of actually trying to prevent data leaving an organization, but there's data that's already left the organization. Let me touch on a number of other points here on this maturity curve, because I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Um, let's go with risk adaptive UBA or user behavioral analytics. 
we call it RAP now, which is Risk Adaptive Protection. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, Casby, Cloud Access Security Broker. So classic DLP, like DLP endpoint, could stop data leaving on a, on a large number of channels uh, and exfiltrate, exfiltration methods. Um, but CASB has come as a point solution that will control or give visibility and control in what users are doing in, in cloud applications. And more and more, like, more and more organizations are using uh, cloud applications and they're probably getting to a stage where they're only using cloud applications. They're moving away from a private application um, uh, deployment uh, base and it, it, it become pure cloud. Um, continuous monitoring is there. Continuous monitoring touches back to what I showed you previous. Uh, DSPM uh, will certainly give you a handle and answer your five questions on, on data, uh, but it's not a it's not a one trick pony. It's not something that you would run once and then once that's done, you're finished with that. It's continuous assessment because one thing is for certain today: you will never have more data than you have today. You will only have an increase in it, and you constantly have to assess that data to ensure that it's classified correctly, it's understood correctly. You understand who has access to access to it and why and what they're doing with it. That never changes, that's full circle. So that DSPM or Data Security Posture Manager will always complement DLP. So for continuous monitoring. So we move on from that and we will talk about the main aspect of this uh, webinar today and that's data security everywhere. Now, a lot of these channels will not be um, unfamiliar to, to, to the audience. Um, organizations have been protecting data, leaving a lot of these uh, control points for quite some time, but as I mentioned already, that was easy in the context that your data is in an SMB, it's on a NetApp filer, it's on an on-premises SharePoint, it's it's on you know servers that's dotted around an organization, depending on how old that organization is. But the but the the landscape of course has changed. Um, users are accessing data not just from on-premise uh, sources, but also cloud sources. And you can see cloud apps there. So that's changed the, the strategy of an organization and how do you actually deal with data loss um, as, as a whole. An organization might have been able to create policies and ensure that everything passed out through a gateway, maybe out through your firewall and whatnot, and your web channel, your email channel, and you can generally stop a lot of data leaving um, unauthorized um, loss of data. But an organization now has to think differently. Uh, no longer is users always on the network. So, so covering off some of these channels are, are all well and good in themselves, but you need to have a probably more holistic approach, a more global approach. So quite simply, no matter where the user goes, whether that's an employee or a contractor, you want to surround them with a data security set of policies that no matter whether they're on network or off network, that you can create the policy and it will protect them no matter where they go, whether they're accessing uh, data from the cloud or accessing data from private sources um, and basically putting a bubble around them. Um, the other challenge now is um, a number of organizations will clearly have an email security solution. They'll have a XDR solution, potentially local antivirus. Um, they'll probably have a separate web solution. They have a next generation firewall. And each of those solutions may be coming from different vendors and organizations will try and replicate the same data loss policy through each of those vendor solutions using each of those vendors DLP light offering. So a lot of vendors give you DLP light in most of their organization, most of their solutions to an extent uh, to cover off uh, the low hanging fruit, PCI, uh, PII and so forth. Um, the problem there is, is that you have to ensure that you've replicated the policy correctly and they're orchestrated in a way that they all act almost the same. And they're all probably sending information into a SIEM or, or probably not sending it anywhere at all. So an organization is thinking, I want to be able to create a DLP policy. I want to layer it in across all the control points. And I want to have a central area where I can actually see what's happening with that data in a single pane of glass. Not every vendor can do that. And there's a reason why some vendors in the top right hand quadrants of the, of the DLP quadrants, and there's a reason why others aren't. This is one reason, single policy, single policy layered in across all the control points. And secondly, um, um, the certain gaps and use cases that organizations want that not every vendor can cover. And there's a reason why we're at the top right-hand corner, and we're going to delve into that now in a moment. So here it is. There's all your typical control points. And uh, to be able to create a policy once in a SaaS-based DLP solution and layer it in across all of these in one go is the Rolls-Royce standard of DLP or data security. And we can do it, of course. 
So we talk about visibility and control. What are we really talking about? Very simple flow. Who, what, where, how, and the action, which falls into line with the five questions we asked earlier on. What is your sensitive data? Where is it? Who has access to it? And uh, what are they doing with that information? So this simple flow makes sense, I'm sure, to most organizations. I believe that you can only get to a stage of maturity like this if you actually understand the data. And I know I've repeated this a few times. If you don't understand it, this is very hard to actually layer it in. You'd probably have to make up policies on the fly and then try and tweak them over time to get them to operate in a certain way. But this is the gold standard uh, in terms of visibility and control. If you know what they're doing, you'll be able to control it. So I will move on from here for a moment and I'll take you here. So security doesn't have to, um, it doesn't have to be difficult. There is five steps to data security everywhere. And I will point out uh, the audience, all of these five are not mutually exclusive. You could choose the ones that are most appropriate to you, where, where, which one would cover off the actual use cases or the holes or the gaps that you have. Very few organizations can just go out and say, give me all five. That, that's not gonna happen. But you might start off somewhere and you might expand over time. You might have a situation where you say, okay, give me DLP endpoint and uh, where my email uh, security uh, providers uh, agreement or contract comes up for renewal, I'll then consider maybe expanding the DLP side of things onto the email channel and so on and so forth. So let me go through them. AI power discovery, classification, orchestration via DSPM. This is what we spoke about in the first, um, this is what we spoke about in the first uh, webinar. The second one is risk adaptive protection. So if I take you back for a moment, back to these policies, you can see very simple, very, what I'd say, rigid or static set of policies based on certain uh, controllable criteria, which is straightforward enough. However, with risk adaptive protection, you could say, I want you to change the action on all of my policies based on the user's risk score. And there's two ways you can, you can work on a user's risk score. The first way is that the user is triggering indicators of behavior, IOBs, and the risk score will, how would you say, organically go increase to a stage where they normally were able to do a certain set of tasks, but because the risk score is say 75 out of 100, all of a sudden that action is then uh, a block or, or, or a reject or, or so forth. The other way um, a user's risk score would increase is where uh, an authorized person in an organization says, I know that person's going to leave or I know that a person's talking to another employer or has been exhibiting behavior that we're not too uh, au fait with. So you would actually manually increase that user's risk score. So this is a great way of saying, hey, I've got really nice policies, but I want the actions to change as the risk score changes. So risk adaptive protection is very, very important for any organization that says, I don't want to rely on static rules because some people might need to have the actions changed on the fly. Uh, cloud apps, endpoint, BYOD. Let me just explain that there. And that's where you have a single SaaS application or a single SaaS controller. And the endpoint is actually controlling the majority of use cases, no matter what a user's doing. So for example, whether they're trying to send stuff to uh, USB, a printer, uh, web content, uh, email client, unmanaged cloud apps like Gmail, Dropbox, WeTransfer, and so on and so forth. That's the segment or that's the area of DLP where you'd probably cover off most of your use cases. Then you've got the classic web channel or users on a, a large organization like a bank might say anything that goes through, out through HTTP or HTTPS uh, is controlled at a central location rather than me putting an agent on every computer. We will just control it centrally that anything goes out through that gateway. We can actually sniff that traffic and we can actually apply our policies um, if they trigger our data uh, policies. And finally, finally, email DLP SAS. Now, D DLP endpoint will control email to an extent, but not everybody sending email through, say, an M365 tenant is sending it straight from an endpoint. You know, you might have third party senders, you might have application servers. You, there's a number of different sending uh, avenues of mail that goes through something like M365 and then out, out to the outside world. So what a lot of organizations do have is they have DLP sitting as an extra hop in front where all mail coming through their tenant is sent through something like our um, DLP email SAS and sent back again to the tenant. And then a decision is made on whether it goes out or whether it's encrypted or whether it's actually quarantined or rejected. 
So these are the five again, not mutually exclusive, not mutually exclusive, but you could you could say which one would actually meet our needs first of all, and if we need to then expand out, you can. One single interface will control all of these because it's all modular. You can choose which ones you want over time, and it's all modular to the one single SaaS application. And I will finish with one point here on this slide. Historically, and we are the market leader in DLP. Historically, a lot of our platforms and solutions in this respect have always been on-prem. Uh, SaaS is now a full offering now at this stage. So um, that, that is a game changer. It means you don't have to manage on-prem infrastructure in, in order to have um, in the enterprise level DLP. Second last slide of the day. Uh, what are the differentiators? What makes ourselves different than some of the others? Um, let me touch on them. Uh, precise ID fingerprinting of structured and unstructured data. Rather than having, if you take a DLP endpoint, for example, rather than having a large repository of, uh, um, of, of information that has to be checked against when you're actually scanning files in real time and data in real time, what we can do is we can do what's called fingerprinting. So we take a fingerprint of all your data. And if, you, uh, if that fingerprint matches any data that's moving in or out, regardless of any classification and so forth, just the fingerprint match, we can take an action on that data. It's great for structured and unstructured data, but I've seen it in some organizations where they scan old data, uh, old documents and invoices and so forth, and they're, they're scanned and you know digitized. And then we take a fingerprint of them. And if they're seen moving out through the classic uh, uh, exfiltration channels, we can act on them. Optical character recognition, you can imagine a situation where you have a Word document that's classified as confidential and it goes out through email or USB or printer and our DLP will absolutely stop that because it's classified as confidential. Well, if I take a screen grab or a snippet of that document and I try to send it out, well, the classification has gone, but we've got optical character recognition so we can actually read the characters in that image and stop it based on a triggering PII, PHI or a combination of factors. That we say if it says account and it has something like a, an IBAN number and an address and a common name, we can act on that. That's a differentiator that others can't do. Detect and apply classification labels from third party solutions, something we could always do uh, for quite a long time. But of course, DSPM can retrospectively do that, not just on data uh, today that people are using and moving around, you know, data in motion, but you know, there might be data sitting there five, six years on a repository. We can reach in, find that, and retrospectively classify it, which is important for when that information is then moving out of your organization. We can then act on it. Uh, machine learning classifiers to identify never seen data before, because there will always be a situation where some data has never been seen before, particularly in the context of never having DSPM. With DSPM, this area is probably covered off, but there was a situation, or there has been uh, quite a number of years where you know, DSPM has been in place and there will be a situation where there's data that has not been considered sitting somewhere that is eventually moved and that we're able to act on it. Um, but DSPM can obviously cover that off. Uh, advanced analytics, identifying risky as users. And I, I've mentioned that and uh, indicators of uh, behavior comes into that as well. People who are doing unusual things like going to LinkedIn at 11 p.m. and starting to log in at 2 a.m. when they normally wouldn't do and doing some large downloads and so forth, they start triggering those. We will start pulling down the shutters when it comes to the policy actions that we have where you could do something today, you won't be able to do it tomorrow. And cumulative analysis drip DLP. There is insider threats and bad actors who who will know that you know there'll be certain filters stopping certain actions from taking place. And what they might say is, I'll take out two credit card numbers today. I might take the two addresses tomorrow, two credit cards the next day or in an hour or whatever. We will accumulate that. And if they trigger two, three, four, whatever you've actually set in the policy, we will then trigger a DLP alert and action based on what you've been doing. We call it low and slow. We will also cover off low and slow exfiltration of data. So again, something that other organizations um, and vendors find it very difficult to um, handle. There is a few others. There's a few other areas that differentiate and we'll come to them in a moment, I'm sure. I'm sure we will be asked. And a recap, a recap on data protection. Gain visibility into data and uh, intellectual property. Straightforward enough to know what's there, to know what's in that data, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to, to classify it correctly and so forth. If you have that visibility, then you've got a chance of actually controlling what's happening with data. Protect data in the cloud, complete visibility and control into cloud data. 
And I will point out at this day uh, on that particular area, I mean, managed cloud applications, other vendors are able to handle that quite well because they've API controls into, you know, managed cloud applications like M365 and Salesforce and so forth. But let's be honest, not every cloud application is managed. What about unmanaged cloud applications? Can you stop me up exfiltrating the information out to Gmail or Dropbox or WeTransfer? Some organizations will say, well, I actually block access to them. But there's some departments in their organization that probably find it as productive to use those things. So organizations can actually have the freedom of saying, I am going to allow access to those areas. I don't have to overblock, or I can have visibility and control as to what's being sent out and downloaded from those um, unmanaged cloud applications. So it's about, it's about, um, it's not just about security. Of course, security is important. It's also about productivity. Um, regulatory compliance. Uh, I've got here GDPR, CCPA, DORA, NIST2, ISO. I even know that the uh, JST or the Joint Supervisory Teams from the EU Central Bank are conducting audits on financial organizations or key organizations in, in countries. And I know that that's prompting um, that's prompting uh, data security conversations with ourselves. Uh, so, so there's many organizations who have almost avoided having to grasp this nettle when it comes to data security. I find that regulatory compliance is actually forcing organizations to actually think about it because if they're found to not actually uh, be doing anything reasonable in terms of data security, any breach would then be you know, severely punished with more severe fines than if they had have actually made a, a proper effort. Because they're, you know, organizations have a lot of uh, private uh, ident identifiable information from the public and so forth, and you have a, a duty to handle that correctly. An upgrade to risk-based data security. I, I mentioned this. Don't just rely on uh, static rules with static actions. Uh, have have those actions, uh, you know, more dynamic based on a user's risk score. If they're, you know, if, if they're more risky, uh, be able to change those actions without you having to go in and change the rule. That's important. And uh, thank you. And next steps, I suppose. Next steps is the free data risk assessment. And uh, that's important. It, 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 there's no obligation. It doesn't cost anything. And if anything, it will give you more information than you have today in your data. That's the final part for me. And I'll hand it over to the audience and any questions that might come in. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. There's been a couple of questions come through. Um, just slightly reword it. When evaluating leading DLP solutions in the market, what key differentiators should I consider when making an informed choice? Ooh, where would I start there? Um, I suppose the best way to approach it is there's a reason why there's vendors in terms of data security that are top right are leaders and there's, there's others that are not there. There's obviously a feature um, disparity between vendors. I'll give you an example, maybe of two or three. It's a long-winded answer, but I'll give you an example. You can imagine an organization implements data security solution from a vendor and they find that they've got gaps such as, I'll give you an example. If I could take a sensitive piece of uh, data, like a sensitive file, and I can uh, I can place that in a nested container, maybe encrypted, uh, sorry, not encrypted, uh, compress it, uh, and then compress it a second time. So it's nested two, three, four, five containers down. With some vendors, I can actually just send that sensitive data out by just taking that simple action. Now, a lot of organizations won't, won't ask that when they're making their purchasing uh, decision but they'll find after the fact that they're not actually protected. And then when an audit comes in, they'll find they're not even compliant. That's one example. Another example would be um, browsers. I mean, the majority of activity that a user does is via a browser. Some vendors will say, we can give you a great level of protection provided you use Edge, for example. Well, do you want to be pigeonholed into that situation where you have to use the, the, the browser that they, that they insist on? If you want to use all browsers, well, the majority of vendors were historically able to cover off DLP on all vendor, on all browsers using something called uh, web extensions. But this month in June, Google have decided that um, Manifest 2 would no longer be supported, which means a lot of organizations or vendors would be unable to um, protect your data leaving on, on the web channel. Um, we've been able to cover that off because we've got two ways of doing it. One is called support for manifest tree, and the other way is having a local proxy so that you can actually be exposed to that data before it actually gets through the browser. So we're able to cover off certain use cases that organizations have not even considered are a problem. 
And by the time they discover it's a problem, they've already purchased something that's not actually protecting them in any way, shape or form. So if I can get through your solution in terms of data security by just knowing those simple things, and if I know them, it's it's going to be on Reddit or somewhere else, you'd probably want to be asking yourself some key questions when you're, when you're, when you're considering a DLT solution. Sorry for the long an answer, but I just wanted to make it very, very, very clear to understand. Uh, just two more questions there. And if anyone else has further questions, please put them in the chat. Um, given that DLP technology has been around for quite some time, why has the concept of a single policy DLP everywhere become crucial nowadays? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, I, I've sort of touched on it in the in the webinar, but I'll repeat it because it's very important, very, extremely important. There was a time where data was only ever on premise. And if you control the gateways leaving that organization, you had a fair chance of putting your arms around that data and controlling what people would do with it. DLP endpoint, for example, would have always covered a lot of those use cases. In terms of the web channel and, and, and SaaS applications, a lot of that data is no longer behind the perimeter. It's already out there. So you need to be able to extend your policies beyond the on-premise stack. Um, I, I think your policies have to follow the user no matter where they go. So if a user is in, on his, on his, either on a personal laptop or a managed laptop, for example, and today they're in Ireland, tomorrow they're in Hong Kong, you want to ensure your same set of DLP policies are extended no matter where they go. Um, that's the difference here. So having visibility and control and data security everywhere is is a, is a, it's a far greater challenge today than it was in the past. It's much harder to control. So if you're an organization, you don't want to be replicating that policy in five different vendor solutions across your different channels. You want to create the policy once and extend it to those channels uh, in a matter of clicks. Thanks, John. And lastly, for a business just beginning to explore DLP solutions, where would you recommend they start? Personally, uh, Ireland is a small country compared to some of the large organizations. I, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong, we're an enterprise DLP uh, organization and we, we have some of the largest customers in the world. I'm talking in the context of Ireland, uh, you know, medium-sized companies primarily. Um, DLP endpoint is where you would start off in conjunction with DSPM. DSPM is gonna give you a handle on your information no matter what size organization you are. But I think DLP endpoint will cover off most of your channels and use cases. Won't cover them all, but it'll cover the majority of them. It's a starting point where you could probably build up a mature policy base, control as many channels. And then if you find you want to extend it to the network channel, the email channel, um, the CASB, the cloud application, managed cloud application channel, you can do that. But DLP endpoints where you start off, because that will cover off USB, printer, web browser, email, and so on and so forth. It will prevent copies and pasting. That's something that will give you a far greater level of control over your data than if you do nothing. So that's where I would start. But DSPM will give you a handle on what the data is, and it will give you, it will, it will start that process. Nobody's going to put in a DLP solution in two or three weeks. It's a process. It's a maturity uh, process where you start somewhere, you know, you, uh, you see it with... Um, when they're opening the, 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 a new building or something like that, the first thing that goes is the shovel into the ground. You know, you have to start somewhere. Your DSPM is your shovel in the ground. And then you can start out from there. Good analogy. And then lastly, John, uh, could you discuss the basic impact of regulatory requirements on data security in general? Yeah, I'll give you my view on that, but Edwin would probably come in as well uh, after that because in terms of regulatory compliance, me being a pre-sales uh, engineer, I normally go and talk to organizations to maybe have them to think about, you know, what they're doing in terms of data security and other technologies like web security and CASB and so forth. I find with regulatory compliance, customers are talking to us. They've been forced or prompted into doing something with data security. There was a time with data security for a lot of organizations as an afterthought, or it's a side issue of security where they'd say, well, I want to do something about it, but I have a lot on my plate. I would find the regulatory compliance is forcing organizations to actually act here because we know what we see in the news in Northern Ireland and down south. If you don't respect the data and there's a breach, the implications of that would be far greater and more expensive than a data security um, posture or a data loss prevention solution. Edwin, you probably, from a compliance point of view, I think Smart Tech would probably have a, a better angle on that side of things. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, we would obviously go in and help with organizations just from a compliance perspective through our governance risk and compliance team, where we will go in and advise them on what they need to be doing. Um, and we obviously go in and do audits as well on, on these organizations. Um, you know, as I said in the first webinar, Compliance regula regulation have really, really been em emphasizing the importance of data security um, quite recently. So especially in areas like governance incident response. So if you take NIST 2, for example, you need to notify regulators within 24 hours within with an early warning report um, and then submit a more detailed notification within 72 hours. And after you've been breached and you're in crisis mode, time is vital. You don't want to spend your time trying to figure out what was taken. So if you've got a strong data security maturity, it will allow you to say to the regulators and, and even to the public that yes, you've been breached and we know exactly what data was accessed because you've got those data security con controls in place. Um, you see a lot of organizations after a breach with their pre-canned response, you know, we, we take your data seriously, but they haven't actually done anything to put those proper controls in place. Um, but, you know, really from a DSPM, um, you know, perspective, it's in place to identify the potential compliance issues um, and compliance risks before they become an issue. So, you know, that's really the power of, of DSPM. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, John. Um, if there's any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to either SmartCheck or ourselves at Forcepoint.